So hi everyone, uh, welcome back to this series of lectures on the statistical mechanics of disordered systems. So um, yesterday we started to discuss problems that come from statistical inference. So I want that we I want to uh, explain again the setting. And so so the the situation is that uh, we observe um, a a noisy version of a rank one matrix. So the rank one matrix, uh, I write X bar, X bar transpose. So the star is for the transpose. And X bar is a vector of N components. The components are IID bounded, and I'm going to denote their low by PN. Okay, just PN like this without a double bar. And, and then there is this W, which is the noise. And, and the noise is a, just a, a matrix of independent standard Gaussians. These are also independent of the X bar. And finally, there is a parameter T, which is just a, a fixed. You know, and we're going to play with this parameter T to try to understand uh, how things change in terms of how hard it is to recover information about uh, what we care about, namely this rank one matrix, X bar, X bar transpose. And our main goal is to, so let me write this, our main goal. Is to understand the, the large end behavior of what we call the minimal mean square error. And so um, um, this, this takes the following form. So it's uh, the expectation of the square of X bar minus the conditional expectation. You remember that one way to understand why uh, this is a, uh, an interesting quantity is that um, this function is that which minimizes uh, the difference with X bar, if we have to choose a function which is measurable with respect to Y. And you know, in the context of this statistical inference problem, we do have to, you know, we only observe Y. So we have to produce an estimator for X bar, which is a function of Y. In other words, is a measurable function of Y. So this is the best one possible. And perhaps, uh, so this is if we want to recover X bar, maybe it's also meaningful to think that we're trying to recover X bar, X bar transpose, you know, the, this rank one matrix. So possibly uh, we can also think about this quantity. Okay, so, so I would like to understand uh, how this behaves when N becomes very large. And uh, in view of this, we, we um, computed last time what is the conditional law of X bar given Y, given the observation of Y. Um, so let me write this down one more time. So we had defined this function HN uh, zero of T and X, which is square root of two T over N y dot x x star minus t over n x x star squared and and with that definition we have seen that uh, we have this interesting observation that the the conditional law of x bar given y takes the form of a gibbs measure uh, similarly to uh, what we have studied in the context of curie bias models. So let me write this, f of x exponential of h and zero dx dp n of x divided by the integral of the expectation. Oops. Okay, so I had only given a, a non-regress derivation of this identity, but uh, it, you know, it's not very complicated to, 
to give a, a rigorous proof uh, of that. And perhaps, so, so there will be some, you remember that when I have a matrix, uh, this thing, uh, you know, so for instance, X, X transpose is a matrix. And when I write uh, this absolute value squared, it means the, the sum of the squares of the coefficients. Um, and, and I have a scalar product associated with this, which I denote by, by this dot, like, like here. Okay, so, so just some, some small remark. Uh, it's, it's kind of useful to get used to doing um, some manipulations with this. Let's say there's a little gymnastics uh, that uh, one gets used to with this uh, notation. So for instance, uh, when we have x, x transpose squared, well, by definition, this is x, x transpose dot x, x transpose. And, you know, transpose is that thing which uh, if you uh, move it to the other side of the scalar product, then uh, you remove the transposition, All right? So, so this is the same as you know, if I move this guy to the right, let's say, and um, no, I'm not making this, I'm going to move, X to the left and X star to the right. I'm going to get that this is the same as X uh, star X squared. Okay, and X star X is a vector of length N. So when I compute X star X, this is the norm of X squared. So this term is the same as the norm of X to the power of four. Okay, so this is just uh, some little commas just so that we get used to you know, playing around with this scalar product. And similarly, when I write y dot x, x star, uh, if I want, I can move this x star to the right and I get uh, y x dot x, which I can also write as x dot y x. Okay, so these are all the same expression. All right, so these are were just uh, simple comments. And, and the one thing we did the last time, which is important is that we, we defined this, uh, uh, bracket notation. So let me write it one more time. So um, I think the best way to think about it is that for each realization of y, like for any y you give me, I define a probability space with x as a random variable. And the expectation in this probability space is denoted with this bracket. Okay, and, and this random variable x is distributed according to the conditional law of x bar given y. Okay, so this by definition is, I mean, if I, if I had the notation for the conditional law of x bar given y, I would write this. Okay, so maybe this could be you know, p of x bar bar y that could, we could decide this in the conditional law of x bar given y. But we have seen, you know, the. Uh, we, we have an explicit expression for this, which is given by this f of x exponential of h and zero of tx dpn of x divided by integral of exponential of h and zero of tx uh, dpn of x. Okay, and it's, uh, um, so there's a question in the chat. Uh, I'm never sure whose name is associated with what uh, scalar product, but here I just mean it's the, uh, you do coordinate by coordinate uh, product. You, you, like uh, if you want, so maybe I'm going to write this. Um, so so the, if I have two matrices of the same size, then A scalar B is the trace of A star B. Okay, so it's just, uh, but if you just think that, you convert any matrix into a vector and you do normal scalar product between the, between the coordinates. Um, yes. So, so it's, yeah, it's kind of useful to, okay, so maybe I can also write this. And so, so you may wonder why uh, we introduced this notation. Why don't we write expectation of f of x bar given y each time? But it's because I will find convenience, at least in terms of notation, 
to sometimes you know write for instance expressions that have this that have this form okay so so I, I imagine that under these brackets everything is computed for fixed realization of x bar and w so so this I don't want you know I want this to be this um, you know, f of x so maybe I could write explicitly with the exponential so it's, it's going to be integral of f of x x bar exponential of h and zero of tx dpn of x divided by okay, the normal exp exponential blah 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 okay and, and it's not the same as you know it, it's it does not it is not equal to to that thing right okay so so I, I would I would have a confusion if I was trying to uh, you see it would be messy for me to if I did not have the notation on the left uh, it would be difficult to talk about this quantity for instance does that make sense? So this is a bit of a subtle point, and uh, you know it gets some time to get to get used to what this notation exactly means. Okay, so so let me say it one more time. Under this bracket thing, the random variable x is sampled according to the law of x bar conditionally on y. Okay, so so just to really clarify that this is not the same as saying x is equal to x bar, for instance, or x is resampled. According to the law of x bar, if the observation uh, with you com reveals complete information about x bar, then you will have x equals to x bar. If the information contained in y reveals nothing about x bar, then x will be just resampled independently from x bar with the same distribution. Okay, and, and in fact, y reveals some intermediate amount of information, and so it will have some non trivial distribution given by this. Conditional law of x bar given y. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to continue making a few comments about this notation. Yes, yeah, so, so this was. Um, so, so now, you know, when, when I just use the bracket, it's still a function of, of this random variable y, right? Because I mean, the notation does not reveal it explicitly, but remember that inside the definition of, oops, <laughs> inside the definition of, of this H and zero, there is the capital Y guy. Okay? So it's still a random variable. Okay, let, let me display again the definition of, the definition of H and zero is here on top. Okay, so, so when I write this, it is still a random variable that depends on Y. So I can take the expectation with respect to this uh, remaining randomness. And, and then I have this double expectation. Which I can uh, rewrite like this if I want. And here, okay, by properties of the expectation, we see that this is the same as the expectation of f of x bar. Okay, so we see that there are there are so, some simplifications that happen if I also take the average uh, with respect to y after I compute this bracket. Okay, but pay attention. I stress again the fact that uh, you know if I remove the the expectations, you know if I were to remove this guy and this guy, then the identity would not be true. And, and similarly, if I if I compute the expectation of f of x g of y let's say where y is the observation then well this is how to explain this yeah this is going to be and this i can rewrite like this okay because y i consider frozen in the computation of the bracket and this I can also rewrite like this. And now y is a okay, g of y is, is y measurable. So I can insert the g inside the conditional expectation here. 
So this is equal to the expectation of And now by properties of, of the conditional expectation, I can remove the conditional expectation. So this is the expectation of f of x bar g of y. Okay, so, so that identity is also valid. But if I try to do, if I were to try to, to do the same with y replaced by x bar, then the, the identity will not be valid. Okay? I will not end up with the f of x bar g of x bar. Okay, because I will not be able to do this move here where I insert this inside the conditional expectation. Okay, X bar is not a measurable function of Y. I, I do these small manipulations because um, I think all of us are uh, at some point uh, confused about this notation, uh, me and myself included. So, you know, maybe I can try to, uh, you know, stress some of the mistakes that uh, one can do by just displaying it, what moves are allowed and what moves are not allowed. Yeah, so, so indeed X and, bar and X bar are not the same quantity, just to reply to the question in the chat. X bar is the, this vector, um, it's this, this thing that we try to recover. Okay, this is in the, in the definition of the problem. Here there is X bar. Okay, but now, the variable little x is some notation for, for a random variable distributed according to this conditional law I described. Okay. So, so it, it is not equal to x bar. Okay. And maybe the best way to think about it is just that this bracket is shorter notation for this, uh, for this long expression. Okay. Okay, and yeah, so maybe this is a, a useful example. You know, when I write f of x, x bar like this, it means this expression, and we see x and x bar do not play the same role, right? x bar is the data, and x is the uh, variable of integration. Yeah, so there is no, at least there is no obvious relationship between x and x bar. It's just that we have certain relationships like this one, for instance. Okay, or, or maybe, yeah, so, so there, there is no immediate relationship between the two. Like, uh, you know, X is not equal to X bar or things like that. All right, and now, uh, so one more piece of notation. It will also be convenient for me to um, to use more than one variable like X. So I would like to have independent copies distributed like X. So we write, so oftentimes people call them replicas, but uh, X prime, X double prime, et cetera, for, uh, to denote independent copies of X under this, this measure with the bracket. Okay, so let me say again, for each uh, realization of this uh, observation Y, we can sample X in this uh, extra probability space, you know, and it's sampled according to this distribution of the law of X bar conditioning and Y. But I, I am not going to only sample X, at least uh, for sometimes I will also want to sample independent random variables distributed in the same way. Okay. So maybe just to, again, perhaps the, at least at the beginning, it's perhaps useful to, to think about this notation as being just a shorthand for a long integral. Okay, so so if, I, if I write this, it's supposed to mean you know, that I integrate um, that I integrate each of the random variables according to this uh, distribution. So maybe uh, if I use uh, some you know this notation I, I introduced before, uh, 
screen to look like this. And if I, yeah, perhaps the most useful thing is to just write explicitly uh, with these exponential terms. So this is going to look like f of x, x prime exponential of hn0 tx plus hn0 tx prime dpn x dpn x prime divided by the integral of the exponential of hn and t o tx dpn of x squared. Okay, I, I could have written the exponential of the sum as well, but then it factorizes. Does, does that make sense? Like uh, you, you see the, the product structure in this expression? Um, yeah, so, so if you want, you can, you know, this is, um, when, when we write, so there's a question in the chat about the Raoult-Dicolin derivative of, of the law of x, and it's kind of you know it's kind of given by by this expression. It's a, you could say the law of x is a, I mean okay, this this gives you what the Radon equilibrium derivative is under this method.
something which a priori uh, is different from this expression. Is that clear or, or so you know to recap, you know, think in terms of explicitly writing the integral with the exponential. Uh, the one below is going to have just integral of g1 of x g2 of x bar and then exponential of hn of x dpn of x and then okay some denominator while this one has um, you know when we do the integration we have um, we integrate over x and x prime okay so these are really two different expressions a priori but the claim is that they are equal uh, if we if we take uh, you know, if we average over everything okay and one one more time if I don't put this extra expectation uh, outside, then the identity is not valid. Okay, so so um, maybe right now you, it's not entirely clear why I insist on this, but uh, we will see uh, when we try to derive the, you know, our uh, beloved partial differential equations, that the the, it is precisely the fact that. You know, whenever some replica appears, we can, in some sense, make it disappear. This is going to be the mechanism by which we can close the equation, you know, by which uh, we can find a, a reasonable equation for the system. Yes, exactly. Uh, someone in the chat is pointing out that this does not depend much on the specifics uh, of what we're talking about. I, I, indeed, so any, this is only relying on the fact that we're dealing with some statistical inference thing, or in other words, that this law of X is obtained by, as the, the conditional law of X bar given something. So, so this is the only thing that is being used. So this is very generic to uh, statistical inference problems. Yeah, that's a good point. So, you know, in particular, you could imagine other statistical inference problems uh, beyond those that are being discussed. And this, this property uh, will still be true and will still be helpful for you to derive partial differential equations. Or, you know, whenever, you know, other methods will also rely on, uh, on the, this being true. Um, yeah, so maybe I, I'll just uh, continue to play a bit with these expressions and massage this uh, minimal mean square, mean square error using this notation. So let's say back to, to MMSC. Um, okay, so the definition is that this is the definition. And well, with our new notation, we can write this as X bar minus uh, the bracket of x squared. And now, uh, if I expand the square, I will get expectation of x bar square minus two expectation of, okay, so I should write x bar scalar bracket x, but I can put the x bar inside if I want. So I'm just going to write x bar dot x and then uh, plus the expectation of and this is the you know the bracket and then squared and this we said we can rewrite this as x dot x bar uh, x prime sorry okay this, this was some observation we did uh, just before stating the proposition And, and by, by this uh, property of Nishimori, uh, if we wish, we can replace this X bar here by, sorry, this X prime here by X bar, okay? And so down the road, what we get is that this minimal mean square error can be rewritten as the expectation of X bar squared minus the expectation of um, X dot, X bar. Okay, so if I want to, so another way to ask, so, okay, so let me, uh, sorry, let me change sentence. 
Um, first, let me point out that this quantity is very simple to understand. Now, this is only about this vector x bar, which uh, we, we know about. Um, so um, explicitly, you know, if I if I write that quantity, this is the the sum of the expectation of x bar i squared. And so this is just n times uh, the expectation of x bar one squared. Okay, and we, we assume we know how x bar one is distributed. So we can compute this number. Okay, so, so this is not the mysterious part. The mysterious part, we do not know uh, this, uh, how this behaves, okay, because um, it's not clear how X and X bar are aligned. But if, if we had perfect observation, then X would be perfectly aligned with X bar. If we had completely uh, lousy observation, then X would be a resampling, an independent resampling of X bar. And so, um, yeah, we, we cannot, uh, you know what I what I'm saying here is that um, an alternative way to ask about the behavior of the minimal mean square error is to ask about the behavior of, of this quantity. Yes, exactly. So so all of these expressions depend on t implicitly, okay? Because t is hidden in in the definition of y and in the definition of the brackets. And, and the question is. As we vary the t, uh, is it the case that x and x bar are aligned or not? Okay, so if x and x bar are closely aligned, it will mean that our minimal mean square error is small. And if x and x bar are kind of uh, not understanding each other, they are kind of orthogonal, it means that our minimal mean square error is large. Does that make sense? And in some sense, yeah, you can yeah. think of. Uh, um, this law of, uh, you know, the, in some sense, okay, no, maybe I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. But, but so uh, are extreme. there extremal cases, right? Yes, 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 yes. The, the, I mean, what I said is, is valid. What, what do you mean? I mean, if t equals zero, we, we if t equals use... zero, then x will be a resampling of x bar. So this will be, uh, this will give you the. Um, you're going to do the product of two independent copies of X bar if you. And if so if is X large, bar is centered, this will be essentially zero. And if T is large, we and if T is large, we are not quite, quite sure, but hopefully, uh, at least if we, you know, if we believe that this gives us perfect information about X bar, then X will be perfectly aligned with X bar. Except, uh, you know, it's not obvious that uh, T very large is exactly the same as saying uh, we have perfect information about X bar. Okay. But uh, it's, you know, essentially, it's true. Okay, thank you. If I was doing the argument with uh, x x transpose, that would be cleaner because really, when t is large, we see essentially uh, x x transpose. But maybe when you see x x transpose, you're not completely sure what x is. So that, yeah. that's why I'm slightly hesitant but to say. You need to make a choice, right? Because uh, in the beginning, t could be multiplying the noise. Uh, I mean, the, the setup is uh, you have this square root of, like, I just chose uh, this encoding of the problem, right? But if, yeah. you had, uh, if you had some multiplication in front of the noise, you could just rescale things, right? If I tell yeah. you I observe uh, uh, you know, this, this vector, it's the same as if you observe uh, two times this vector, as long as you know it, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I see. So I can always put one in front of the noise if I want. Okay. All right. Yes, and in, in the, I think it's in problem set number um, uh, seven, we, there is the same computation to do uh, with the, you know, like this this version of the minimal mean square error where we replace x bar by uh, by x bar x bar transpose. Okay, so so the first exercises in in uh, in these problems in this problem set number seven are about playing with uh, this notation yet some more. 
Okay, ich glaube, das nicht. Um, are there other questions? So, um, like in the Cray-Weiss model, in order to make progress on our understanding of this uh, measure or this yeast measure, we're going to try to study something analogous to this free energy, you know, this FN that was uh, uh, going around with us all the time. We are going to be interested in the study of I'm going to call it Fn0 of t, because later there will be another Fn of t. I'm going to explain in a second why uh, another version of Fn will be necessary. Okay, so, so uh, we will see that uh, Exactly as in the curry vice model, when we look at the derivative of t, uh, sorry, the derivative with respect to t of this quantity, we're going to learn useful information um, such as uh, maybe, maybe uh, of this sort of type. So uh, we'll do this calculation in a minute, but uh, I don't want to do it right now. Okay, so maybe I'll just I'll just mention. So, so um, if we compute uh, the time derivative of the expectation of this guy, I'm going to explain uh, uh, shortly that this is one over n square expectation of x dot x bar squared. Okay, so so this looks very nice. Uh, we we want to understand this quantity and. Uh, just like with query bias, uh, it's more convenient to try to understand the function fn uh, first and then uh, worry about the derivatives. And we, we, we can use the same tricks as for query bias to learn about derivatives. But the, the problem I want to point out is that, so we want to approach this uh, using similar strategy as for query bias. I mean, the, the PDE strategy you know, with the Hamilton Jacobi equation. But as it stands now, if I differentiate in T, uh, I get this. And if I, you know, I can differentiate more and more, but I'm not going to get any uh, nice closed expression uh, for these derivatives. So what's going on? Like, how do I find my partial differential equation? And currently, the situation is a bit similar to if we were studying the curry weiss model, but we had not thought about adding this h term in the exponential. So imagine that you're starting to study the curry weiss model and you, you only write you know, uh, t over n, sum of sigma i, sigma j, and that's it, nothing more in the energy function. Then we can differentiate in t as much as we want, but we are not going to find the relevant partial differential equation. So in fact, uh, yes, yes, so, so this, uh, No, no, Pn is, is the low, okay, so the y is, is hidden uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the in, in the definition of Hn0 of Tx. But here I'm, I'm really just looking at this normalization constant in the Gibbs measure, you know, just like for curry bias. Let me display the, the measure again. <laughs> That's for the long score. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so you see, I'm just looking at this, this object. Okay, so it's really a Pn of X. Pn is the, the original measure of the, of the signal X bar. Okay, so, so yeah, what I wanted to point out is that, in fact, for query vice, there was something very convenient, which was that essentially from the start, we, we kind of felt that it was good for us to include this 
uh, sum of sigma i with the h in front inside our energy function. But perhaps in some contexts, we, you know, perhaps we're not as smart or, or we don't come with the same set of intuitions and we don't think about it. So, so in fact, when we try to approach the resolution of, of these problems, the first task is to make sure that uh, we have enriched the energy um, in, in the right way, quote unquote. And you know, what, what it is that we want from this extra H guy that was in the Kuevice model. Well, it, it, it did two things which were very nice for us. The first thing is that it allowed us to identify a relationship between the derivatives, right? When we had this ability to differentiate in T and in H, we could say, oh, look, it seems that the differential in T looks like the square of the differential in H. Well, that's one thing that it did uh, that was nice for us. But the second thing that it did, which was nice to us, is that uh, when we were setting t equals zero, we could explicitly compute what is left. Okay, so in, in the language of the partial differential equation, we could identify what is the relevant initial condition. Okay, so so the, the, this thing that we need to add to the energy function has to be at the same time, you know, sufficiently rich in some sense or expressive that we can uh, match the derivatives, but also it has to be sufficiently simple that when only this extra term is present, I can actually compute the free energy essentially explicitly. Okay, and this is this uh, double requirement that uh, we're going to need to fulfill. And in fact, uh, as uh, uh, has been pointed out uh, at some point, um, here we, we need uh, yet a third requirement, which is that we want to really make sure we do not destroy this Nishimori property, because I claim, and we will see later, that this will be critical to our uh, managing to find a closed partial differential equation. By closed, I mean, uh, I just mean the partial differential equation. Okay, so some, some relationship between derivatives that looks like uh, there is no error, or at least the error becomes small. And, and as uh, someone pointed out in the chat, this will work as long as we keep the inference structure in place. Okay, so, so I'm not, you know, perhaps the, uh, my first attempt would be to just say, oh, I'm going to try to add stuff inside this energy function. And then I'm going to add plus H times whatnot, whatnot. But I'm not going to approach it like this because if I write this, I'm going to destroy the fact that this is, uh, a conditional expectation, and I do not want to destroy this. Okay, so instead I'm going to say, oh, uh, we observe this kind of relatively complicated uh, function of X bar, but also we, we observe some simpler function of X bar. And, and this will preserve the inference structure. Okay, so this is what, what we're going to do after the break. Maybe uh, we can take a five minute break. And, uh, and then we resume. Uh, I, I'm happy to take questions uh, if there are, of course. Yeah, and, and perhaps as, a, as we are taking this break, I, I continue to make some small comments. Um, and uh, when, like the, when we look at this derivative, it's um, we can we can kind of guess the sort of extension we would like to do for the energy because, uh, especially coming from this curry vice model, it would be really nice if, if we could find some way to uh, make sure that. When we add this extra parameter, I'm, I'm still going to call it H. Uh, what we get when we differentiate is, is, the, is the expectation of just X dot X bar. Okay, and then maybe you know, we could hope that uh, the difference between these two objects is small. So essentially we're going to shoot for achieving something like this. Okay, I'm going to grab someone. Thank you. 
All right, so uh, maybe I, I, I story with you. So yeah, I want to do this enrichment. And as I said, we're going to do this by just postulating that we observe yet another thing, but something hopefully simpler than uh, what we have uh, been observing so far. So um, I'm just going to write, we need to enrich the model. Uh, and uh, yeah, like similarly to uh, what with Curie we actually needed to have this extra H times sum of sigma i uh, around. Okay, so so we we extend the model or the setting, let's say, by assuming that we also observe. So I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to have my uh, parameter H, which here I'm going to assume is non-negative. It's going to be convenient for me that it's non-negative. And we also observe, I'm going to call Y tilde this other observation. And what could I do? Well, I could just, instead of observing this rank one matrix, I could observe just uh, the vector X bar itself. I mean, a noisy version of it. This is what I'm going to postulate. This is a Z. Um, so H is some fixed parameter and Z is a, a vector of, of independent standard gases. And I don't say it each time, but um, these are also independent from X bar and independent from W. Okay, so, so in total, we observe um, this Y that we had uh, at the beginning and also this Y tilde. So maybe I'm going to write a script Y. Yeah, I'm going to comment. That's a good question. I'm going to comment in a second on, on why I put square roots uh, uh, everywhere. Um, but yeah, that, that's a very natural question because that, that's not what we did there for career wise. Uh, I'm going to explain this in a second. Um, so in today we observe uh, the, the pair Y, Y tilde, which I am denoting uh, uh, curly Y. And now I'm not, I'm not going to do it again, but uh, similarly as before, we can compute the conditional law of X bar given Y, and we're going to find some expression. So a similar computation. As before, gives, and that's why there were, there were zeros uh, floating around uh, you know, on the HN and FN, because now there is no zero anymore. Okay, so I'm going to again write the conditional law of X bar given Y as a Gibbs measure. So now no zero on, on HN, so it depends on T, H and X. And then I divide by the exponent, exponential. And let me display uh, what HN is. So it will be, I mean, the first part will be just this HN zero we had before. And then in a very similar structure, uh, square root of TH Y tilde dot X minus H, X squared. Because so it's really exactly the same, except that before here we had XX transpose and here we had XX transpose, but now it's just X. 
Oh, yes. Thanks a lot for this uh, question in the chat. Uh, indeed, a uh, big mistake in my notation. Uh, this is the curly Y. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> that seems quite crucial. Yes. And so, I mean, maybe it's useful to that we write this explicitly. Um, okay, so maybe, okay, as a first step, I'm going to rewrite what is HN0. So it was like square root of 2t over n, um, y dot xx transpose minus t over n xx transpose squared plus the same guys and now you know recall that uh, y is square root of 2t over n x bar x bar transpose plus w and and y tilde has also you know the expression that was just above right it's just just here on top okay so i'm going to substitute just to display more explicitly the structure of this of this object okay so let me do the substitution um so equals so i'm going to start with the with the, with the w that comes from the y so square root of 2t over n and then okay maybe i'm going to write x dot wx and then um, there's the x bar x bar transpose which comes against this guy and this okay oops I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's not difficult to see, you can rewrite it like this. So I'm just going to write like this. And then there was uh, this term, which we said is just the, the, the norm of X to the four. That's the, 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 the first two terms give me this. And now uh, the last two terms give me square root of two H x dot z plus 2h. So you know, this is when I replace y tilde by what it is. So I get 2h x dot x bar and then minus h a times uh, x squared. So it looks a little bit uh, bulky or it's a little bit of a long expression, but I really want to emphasize one thing in this expression is that this should really evoke spin glasses to you and especially the first terms okay so i want that we focus on on these terms here so if i was writing x dot wx explicitly you know let me just uh, do it in the margin x dot wx this is i can write sum of wij xi xj and you know except that uh, i changed w for j and x for i mean w used to be j and x used to be sigma but this is exactly what shows up in the sk model you remember the sk model was sum of jij sigma i sigma j where jij is, is our gases and the sigmas were Bernoulli plus or minus one but if i want in this setting i can imagine that uh, in fact uh, the original uh, x bar was was sampled according to this uh, Bernoulli uh, distribution. Okay, so so this and the other guy uh, x dot z is is kind of simpler, but if you want, it's a random magnetic field. You know, it's a sum of x i z i. You know, it's also something that is valid within some spin glass model. Okay, so so this is like uh, this pink uh, pink part is like I'm going to call it a spin glass. Uh, like or a spin glass type and this other part uh, which you know maybe sounds kind of uh, uh, bulky and long to write is is actually only going to help us because this is you know they are here because we are dealing with them, some statistical inference problem so they are here 
so that the Nishimori identity is, is valid. So if you want at least uh, one way to heuristically think about the problem is, is that it's a spin glass problem, except uh, you're allowed Nishimori on top of this. Okay? And, and these yellow terms, they are meant to make sure that Nishimori property is valid. Okay, so, so they will be very harmless. They will only help us whenever needed. Does that make sense? So I think it's, uh, you know, perhaps when I started to talk about this problem of statistical inference, it was perhaps not obvious why this relates to uh, the spin glasses. But I hope that now the connection is, is clear because we see that down the road, this conditional expectation is a Gibbs measure. And the energy inside this Gibbs measure looks very much like the energy we want to study for spin glasses, except that there are these terms in yellow, but uh, I claim that they are only here uh, to help us. Okay, and uh, so, so from now on, we, we, do, we always do the, you know, from now on, this is really our energy function. Uh, it's always this HN. Okay, so uh, from now on, the bracketing is defined with respect to HN, not HN zero. Okay, and, and similarly, I can define the, the independent copies with X and X prime and X double prime. Um, and uh, as we have discussed many times already, the Nishimori property is still valid because we have, we still have that our Gibbs measure is the conditional expectation with respect to something. Okay, um, yes, so, so now I'm going to answer the question uh, that was posed in the chat, very natural question. Why do I choose this scaling with the square roots everywhere? And I think now uh, it starts to make more sense because we see that in this energy function we want to study, the square root of T is multiplying a Gaussian. And so when you see square root of T times a Gaussian, you should, you should think that this is very natural, right? Because this is, you know, Bourdain motion, at least uh, each fixed time marginal is a, a square root of T times the standard Gaussian. So if you want, this is a way to encode the, a Borean motion, except we don't say Borean motion. We just say, oh, square root of T times a Gaussian. Perhaps a cleaner statement would be to just observe that this is how you, you scale the variance linearly with T and H. And yes, yeah, so, so relatedly, I would like to um, make an extra comment, which is if we want, we can, W is, is, the, is this matrix full of random noises. W is a noise in our original observation. You remember the, our observation is, is uh, written on top of the screen here. Is this y equals da da da. And it has this plus w, right? W is a noise term. So it's, it's really independent Gaussians like in the definition of the SK model. Yes, uh, so I want to make a, one more uh, observation that relates to the idea that we should think about the square root of t times the Gaussian, times the Gaussian as a Borean motion. And I'm going to call this uh, Ito calculus without Ito. And as uh, someone pointed out uh, at some point, uh, Ito calculus without Ito is just calculus. And so let's see how we do uh, just calculus. Uh, let me clarify what I mean here. So let's say that let, let G be a standard Gaussian. Uh, so, yeah, so, so from, from Ito's calculus, using Borean motion, we, we know that and if you don't know, uh, uh, no worries. Like, uh, just take my word for it. Uh, the, the following formula is valid. If you take the exponential of a Borean motion minus uh, the quality variation, then this is equal to one. Okay. If you don't know it, just just take. Believe me that this is true. Okay. And and the question I want to ask is. Let's imagine we have never heard about Borean motion. 
uh, how do we uh, say that this is valid? Okay, we don't want to use itocalculus. This is just uh, something involving a standard Gaussian. There should be a way to, to find that this is true without uh, having to study uh, stochastic integrals for a year. Okay. Uh, so how do we see that this is true? And so by easily, I mean indeed uh, you know, doing it to calculus with a pito, so just using calculus. Um, and perhaps one thing uh, we could try is to see that the time derivative of this is zero. So, so let's uh, if I do this, I'm going to get one over square root of two t g minus one times the exponential. And this is supposed to be zero and, and I'm still kind of confused and I don't see why this is true. But the thing is, um, we have to remember that G is a Gaussian. It should be important that G is a Gaussian. So, so I need to display the fact that G is a Gaussian and not some other random variable. So we're going to do what is called Gaussian integration by parts. Which really is just Gaussian integration, it's just integration by parts. So if I write explicitly, let's say, you know, imagine I compute this. Well, this is the same as an integral of f prime of x exponential of minus x squared over two uh, dx, right? This is just uh, an integrated by parts. Let's say that f is a bounded measurable function. I mean, bounded uh, differentiable function, t1 function with bounded derivative. And as a consequence, if I rewrite this uh, using the expectation notation, I should have that uh, g f of g is equal to the expectation of, uh, sorry, of the expectation of f prime of g. And so in particular, if I try to compute expectation of g exponential of code of two t g minus t, well, I differentiate with respect to g, this exponential function, and I will get square root of 2t expectation of, uh, sorry, of exponential of square root of 2t g minus t. Okay. And now we see that uh, the identity on top of this uh, screen is valid because the square root of 2t is simplify and we have the same exponential minus the exponential and, and we're done. Okay. So the identity on top is valid. <laughs> okay, on top of the screen currently, but uh, now I'm going to scroll and <laughs> things are going to change. Okay, does that make sense? So, so I want to uh, generalize this a little bit so that we can easily compute the, the derivatives of our free energy later. Okay. So here is a, uh, the generalization. I'm going to call it a lemma. So, which uh, is, is based on Gaussian integration by parts. Okay, so, so let's say that F is a bounded measurable function uh, defined on the relevant space. And uh, so I claim that we have the following. So you remember that this, this z is a vector of length n and each component 
is a, I mean, its coordinates are independent standard Gaussians. And I want to uh, compute what happens when I, sorry, when I dot this against some arbitrary function of X and X bar. And I claim that by this uh, Gaussian integration by parts, we can see that this is square root of two H times the expectation of X minus X prime dot F of X, X bar. And similar formulas also hold for, uh, if I have, okay, so maybe it's not entirely obvious what is the generalization. So if I have two replicas, Then okay, we will see in a second why this makes sense. But what 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 happens is that the x should be replaced by x plus x prime, and the, then it's minus some independent copy of that thing. So it should be x plus x prime minus x double prime minus x triple prime. That shows up. So it's going to be x plus x prime, and then I can just write minus twice x double prime. It's the same as writing minus x double prime minus x triple prime. Okay, this is the, the formula. And it's also useful at some point to, um, to have uh, handy what happens when we compute the square of such things. And in this case, the, what happens is kind of as if you, as if you, you, you split the square and you pretend that one of the z's is frozen and you apply the first formula. So you get x minus x prime dot f of x x bar. All of this multiplied by z dot f of x x bar. And then there's some extra term, which is the, the square norm of f. Okay, so lots of uh, formulas, but um, you know, it's just it's just a recording these uh, Gaussian integration by parts. Uh, so let me prove the the first formula. Okay, so so f I should think of this. So the f is a function that takes it's dotted against z, and z is a vector of size n. So here I mean that f is also. Uh, taking values in Rn, okay? And I'm going to do it coordinate by coordinate and I'm going to apply uh, this rule we just saw with for, for Gaussians. So for each I, let's say for each I between one and N, we're going to compute the expectation of, oops, sorry the expectation of zi, this is a z. I'm sorry, my, my z uh, notation is perhaps a bit unusual. But this is a z, zi fi of x, x bar. Okay, and uh, I kind of like the way uh, someone put it uh, earlier, which is that when we, you know, this bracket thing is really only x is being integrated, right? Uh, all, all the other variables are, are kept frozen. So if I want, I can rewrite this as the expectation of zi uh, times the brackets fi x x bar. Maybe it will be useful if I if I rewrite explicitly this bracket thing. So let me do this. So it's expectation of zi and then um, ah, maybe I'll, I'll, yeah, I'm hesitating. No, I'm going to write this. Fi of x, x bar, exponential of hn, th, dpn of x, divided by the same exponential.
Okay, so all, all I have done uh, when I was going from, from this line to this line, what I've done is you know, the ZI was inside the, the, the integral and just pulled it out. Okay, so that's just what I've done. And so if you've already forgotten the, how gastro integration by path work, let me display it one more time. Uh, this is the relevant formula. Oops, let me like this. So when we have a Gaussian times some complicated function of the Gaussian is the same as expectation of the derivative of that function. So here we are exactly in this setting. Uh, this is the Gaussian. And this is some complicated function of ZI. You know, the, the ZI is hidden in the definition of HN. So this is the same as, so this is equal to the expectation of the derivative in ZI of this whole expression, integral of fi xx bar, exponential of hn thx, dpn of x, divided by the integral of Okay, um, so this looks perhaps a little bit intimidating, but um, in fact, the, the ZI appears in a relatively simple way inside the, this expression. Um, so perhaps I, I can display one more time. What is the expression for HN? Let me scroll back up. So here is our, our HN, is this uh, sum of six terms. That sounds like a lot of terms, but we only care about the Z here, okay? And, and what happens when we differentiate respect to Z. And the Z is only here, okay? And in fact, we only care about ZI, which is only uh, appearing as you know, ZI times XI, and then there's the square root of 2H as well. Okay, so it's square root of 2H, ZI, XI, Plus a bunch of terms which don't depend on ZI. Okay, so this is what appears in the exponential. We have, we're trying to differentiate some exponential of square root of 2H ZI XI plus some terms which have nothing to do with Z. So when we differentiate, what will show up is what is in front of the ZI, which is square root of 2H XI. Okay. So let me scroll back down. We remember square root of 2H times xi, okay, so, so hidden in there, we have our square root of 2h xi zi, and when we differentiate, it produces the, the square root of 2h xi. I'm going to manage saying it. So I'm going to get expectation of, I forgot the square root of 2h, let me add it in front, square root of 2h, expectation of uh, xi and then fi of x x bar. Okay, then uh, it's just the, the, the usual um, gas yes, thing. So this is when, when I differentiate the numerator, but there is also the denominator, of course. So, you know, some, some zi is also hiding uh, inside the denominator. And what happens when I differentiate in there is, okay, another 2H will, will show up. And what I will get is the, the GIST measure for XI times the GIST measure for FI of X, X bar. No, this is a very general, oh, and I forgot the expectation. This is a very general pattern when we, differentiate a GIST measure, we find correlations between the relevant variables. So you see, this is the correlation between Xi, Fi of X bar. No, no, this is, okay. This whole expression is the correlation between Xi and Fi. And this is a very standard uh, phenomenon. This, it, does, it does not really depend on, on the specifics at, at play. When we differentiate this, this quantity, this is what we see. Okay, 
And, and now you remember, if I want, I can re rewrite this quantity as just inside one single uh, angular bracket with using this prime notation. This is kind of a convenient way for me to denote this multiplication of expectations. Okay, so if I combine everything, I get square root of 2h expectation of xi minus xi prime fi of x x bar. Okay, now if I sum over i, I get the relationship that was announced. Okay. And so, so this is the end of the argument. And you know, to, to get the second statement, it's really exactly the same, except when you have these two copies, x and x prime, you have to think that in, ex, in the exponential, you have exponential of hn of x plus exponential of hn of x prime. So now in the exponential, what is in front of the zi is xi plus xi prime. You see, and that's why when you do the computation for the second line, you have this x plus x prime that is showing up here. Okay, and then minus the, you have, it's always a correlation. So you have to, to do minus the, the replicated thing. Okay, and the last, the last statement is also uh, derived similarly. Does that make sense? So, okay, uh, on Friday, I, I ended uh, with some delay. So maybe uh, today I can, I can save you a few minutes uh, and, and stop here. So next time we're going to use this statement uh, in order to compute the derivatives of Fn and, and to find relationship between the derivatives. Yeah, so thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, as always, I'm very happy to take questions. And also maybe there is a social today, no? Uh, I don't know if some organizer can confirm or inform. Um, well, we had them on previous Tuesdays, uh, I think. It's natural to continue. Yes, um, okay, so at least uh, I will be um, around uh, unless there's really no one. So yeah, I will be to the, going to the social. So, uh, yeah, and Thomas has posted the link on the chat. Thanks, Thomas. If anyone has lost it. Yeah, and I'm happy to take questions. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Ah, yes. so, so I can explain uh, more calmly uh, the, 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 this derivation. Um, okay, so, so let me, so in this denominator, we have square root of two A, okay, maybe I'm going to change color. Otherwise it's going to get confusing. So in, inside here, there is square root of two H um, Zi Xi, okay? So I'm, I'm going to only differentiate the denominator just to see how this term works. Um, so what we would get, so okay, this is the end of the, of the proof. Uh, what we would get is, um, okay, so what happens when we differentiate the denominator? So there is, there is this guy which we sticks around, okay? We, we don't touch it when we differentiate the denominator. And then, okay, maybe I should have put it down there. Okay, so this was just fixed. I'm, I'm only differentiating the denominator. And what happens when I differentiate, you know, one over F, I get minus F prime over F square. So I have a minus and then a, a ratio. And F prime is square root of two H uh, Xi exponential of blah, blah, blah divided by the square. So exponential of blah, blah, blah squared. I hope it makes sense, my blah, blah, blah. Right? It's the HN of THX. And so if I reorganize this expression, you see, so here, here there is a square. I'm going to use one term in combination with this guy and one term in combination with this guy. Okay, so, so on the right side, I get, minus expectation of bracket fi of xx bar. And then the, the second term is the square root of 2h xi. 
Does that make sense? Yes, so there's a, uh, another question about, so the, the, the second equation, in the second equation, what, what will show up instead, you know, if, we, if we want to write explicitly the, the integral, and, and if we imagine that in, in here, there's also some x prime, here I have to add uh, hn of uh, t and h x prime. And so in this case, the, what you know this thing in front of the zi is going to be you know i would have square root of 2h zi xi plus square root of 2h uh, zi xi prime okay so when i differentiate i get xi plus xi prime so exactly the same way i will get um so let me write it like this i get square root of 2 uh, square root of 2h expectation of xi plus xi prime fi of xx bar minus xi plus xi prime bracket fi of x x bar okay and and, uh, and this i can rewrite as a square root of 2h expectation of xi plus xi prime minus two xi double prime fi of x x bar. Does that make sense? And then I sum over i and I get the result. 